The Enlightenment is probably one of my favorite periods of history. For so many years, European art was largely dominated by overt themes of religion and mythology. Then, in a post-Protestant Reformation world, Enlightenment thinkers and philosophers suddenly appeared on the scene. This period was marked by several scientific advancements, such as the steam engine, which would change the world as we know it. It is easy to look at this period and assume that the concept of faith and religion was essentially dead. After all, Enlightenment thinkers championed rationality and reason over unfounded beliefs. Long gone were the days of church members being the major patrons of the arts. Joseph Wright of Derby was famous for his paintings of the scientific revolution in action, giving us a glimpse of the budding analytical community. What, you may ask, could be more secular than that? Today, I will be arguing that the artwork that Wright made during this period cannot be fully separated from a religious interpretation. But first, let's discuss the odd relationship between the Enlightenment and religion itself. In his essay, Pursuing a Rational Religion, Brent Jurgensen discusses how famous Enlightenment thinkers were not entirely detached from religion themselves. Quote, the focus of more famous philosophers such as Descartes on reason and faith was prominent and had a lasting effect. Furthermore, the religious efforts of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's less celebrated focus on the preservation of morality and Immanuel Kant's focus on religion functioning as a foundation for ethics and scientific research coincided with the efforts of Spratt, Priestley, and Euler, end quote. He goes on to explain, quote, Scholars are discovering the relationship between these two powerful institutions to be much more civil than contemporary popular discourse often presents. Such can be found in Thomas Lessel's work on the common contemporary misrepresentation of Galileo's suffering at the hands of the Catholic Church in comparison to the accounts of the issue in historical documents, an understanding that is much more recently confirmed by Maurice Finocchiario." End quote. This is incredibly important to note going forward, as it challenges the common beliefs about how religion and rationality coincide. They are not polar opposites, as one may come to believe. To further prove my point, let's take a look at a religious figure who subscribed to Enlightenment beliefs, rather than the other way around. Benedict XIV was a former pope of the Roman Catholic Church who, surprisingly, was a scholar of the Enlightenment. He attempted to make agreements with more secular institutions, aimed to rationalize the practices of Catholicism, and so on. In the book Benedict the Fourteenth and the Enlightenment, the authors state that, quote, he worked to reduce the influence of miracles and external practices, as well as to address the needs of contemporary science. His papacy stimulated Catholics to research Christian sources with renewed epistemological vision, and to reduce devotional practices to their bare essentials, creating a piety focused on Christ, devoid of superstition and excessive sentimentality." End quote. I hope now that it's obvious to you that religion and the Enlightenment both influence each other equally instead of being a violent struggle for control. It would be foolish to believe that the scientific revolution divided people into two mutually exclusive groups with incompatible beliefs. Now, let's talk about the Enlightenment idea of aesthetics. Those in the scientific community valued what they could see and interact with in the real world, as this was the pillar of empirical evidence. As such, beauty appealed to the human senses, creating something that could not only be observed but appreciated. These aesthetics were the subject of much scrutiny and philosophical debate as intellectuals pondered the reason why humans could perceive beauty at all. In Dorothy Muke's The Practices of Enlightenment, she analyzes True Christianity, a devotional guide by Johann Arndt, and its influence on philosophers. After Arndt's discussion on observing an ordinary plant seed and contemplating its connection to the fall of man, Muke says this, quote, I want to argue that it is this kind of isolation and focus on relatively commonly observable phenomena, which are framed as bearers of a complex significance that not only provides the key to the long-lasting popularity of Arndt's work, but also lays the groundwork for a kind of observational practice that would eventually become the domain of aesthetic experience." End quote. This is key to understanding why science and religion are intrinsically linked together. If we take Muke's inspiration to heart, observation not only serves as an intellectual purpose, but a spiritual one as well. It allows us to take ordinary objects and apply deeper meaning and understanding to them, such as the ordinary apple seed. 
So far, I have been trying to prove to you that the Enlightenment was not purely anti-clerical, and that the situation was much more deeper and complex than two opposing concepts. Now, we can finally analyze the art itself. Let's take a look at Wright's various paintings. Observation is a common theme throughout Wright's body of work. An experiment on a bird in the air pump is one of his most well-known paintings, showing a professor and an audience watching the titular experiment. The cockatoo inside the air pump is to be deprived of oxygen, and it's unknown whether the professor will choose to save its life or not. Wright's signature style, his dramatic rendering of candlelight, is on full display here. While obviously not a universal symbol, bright, radiating light often represents something holy. The different reactions of the group of people are all very distinct, a mix of intrigue and fear. Undoubtedly, if the people in this painting were real, this experience would be unforgettable for everyone involved. The experiment is so simple, and yet it causes such a reaction among the observers. A philosopher lecturing on the orrery is a very similar piece, and is just as iconic. Again, we see the use of stark lighting emanating from the focal point of the painting. The orrery in question is a model of our solar system, used to display the positions of different celestial bodies at various times. What's notable is how the planets aren't the focus of the piece, rather the orrery's entire structure is. The mechanical planets are tiny compared to everything else, and are largely obscured by the figure in the foreground. Again, the theme of observation is prevalent, but with a twist this time. Instead of looking up at the stars and charting them out, the audience instead looks down on the man-made model, taking in the clockwork motions that are otherwise imperceptible to the human eye. Both the complexity of the orrery and the solar system itself are equally impressive and awe-inspiring. One painting, above all, sticks out to me. Joseph Wright's The Alchemist Discovering Phosphorus was painted in 1771, using the same medium as all his other works, oil on canvas. Compared to his other paintings of scientific experiments, this one is largely different. The alchemist depicted is not an image of Brandt, who was the person who actually discovered phosphorus. The setting is also not depicted accurately, instead showing dramatic medieval architecture that was not historically correct. The painting, despite being based on a real event, looks like a work of fantasy. What's most interesting, however, is the piece's full title. The alchemist, in search of the philosopher's stone, discovers phosphorus, and prays for the successful conclusion of his operation, as was the custom of ancient chemical astrologers. In addition to it being very lengthy, the title reveals a lot about the intentions behind this work of art. The odd pose of the alchemist is suddenly him kneeling in prayer. The radiant phosphorus is no longer just an element, but a message from God. The alchemist now resembles a prophet who is experiencing the divine phenomena. The moon shining through the ornate gothic window is now the eye of God looking down upon the event. And throughout it all, the brilliant light of the phosphorus illuminates the dark laboratory, burning much brighter than the candle. The work is undeniably spiritual in nature. During my research for this video, I've seen many sources describe Wright's works as, quote, a significant record of the struggle of science against religious values, end quote. However, I don't think that's entirely true. While the worlds of science and religion often fail to coexist, Wright doesn't paint pictures of these failures. Instead, he shows us a world where scientific breakthroughs are revelations from God, where observation changes our perceptions of the world entirely, where we can look down upon the universe, seeing the world from the eyes of the Creator. I don't think that Wright was a spiritual man, but I do believe he saw a connection between the divine and the rational that we haven't considered in the modern era. We were not there to experience all the nuances the Enlightenment had to offer, nor can we ask Wright why he painted what he did. All we can do is analyze the works that he left behind.